Hi, this is Nicole Kupchik and I'm here with 10 Minute Tidbits. Today, I've got the honor of speaking with Dr. Ahmed Hegazi. How are you? Good, good. How are did you? Did I say it right? You did. Okay. <laughs> I'm practicing his last name. So, uh, well, it, it, we're super, up for, well, first of all, let me start, st stop stumbling over my words here, but we're super excited. So we're here in Miami Beach at the Chillin' at the Beach Conference and having an amazing time. Um, you presented. I did. And it was impressive. Well, thank you. Yeah. So you're from uh, London, Ontario, Correct. in Canada. Mm -hmm. And can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? So you're triple board certified in? Uh, critical care, anesthesia, and I'm also anesthesia certified from abroad. Which is impressive, um, yeah. Yeah, I've been in London, Ontario for 10 years now. Practicing okay. in uh, London Health Sciences Center. I do ICU. I did quite a bit of anesthesia, which currently I'm just doing ICU. Uh, and I'm also doing a master's in public health at the Harvard School of Public Health as well. Yeah, so he's, you know, just in his spare time. <laughs> I love it. I'm just kidding. So, uh, but, but, okay, so we'll, we're going to talk about your presentation, but I want to say, first of all, a lot of Americans kind of have this attitude, you know, that we can't go to socialized medicine because you'll have to wait in line to get care. Now, the conference that we were, uh, we were at was all about um, kind of neuro cardiac arrest patients and managing temperature. So do patients have to wait in line if they have a cardiac arrest in Canada? Absolutely not. <laughs> So, so I just want to make this point. There is a very effective triage system in Canada. So if you have an urgent situation, you're presenting with chest pain, you've arrested on the scene, you get the care you need right then and there. Uh, no questions asked about how can you afford this, how yes. can you, you know, uh, pay for this. It's all, that's the benefit of it. You know, the taxpayers go where they should yeah. in, in delivering health care. And so, yeah, there's no lineup for cardiac arrest waiting in a merge. They all get uh, taken to ICU right away. All right, so they all get treated, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a really important point because, you know, like the, the types of care, you know, the type of care that we're talking about, critical emergency and critical care, can be very expensive. And, and people can go bankrupt in the United States when they have a, a big event like this. But in Canada, that's absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the only situations where you need support is usually long-term drug plans. Um, but other than that, all hospital care is taken care of. Yeah, which yeah. is uh, super impressive. Okay, so you gave a great talk today. So you, you've been trying some innovative methods of managing temperature in your ICU. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing? Sure. So we were experimenting or trialing with an oesophageal cooling device, which is um, a novel way of controlling temperatures, both cooling and warming. Um, it basically serves as a, um, uh, it's a catheter that goes down the esophagus. It, you can um, feed through the central lumen. You can administer medications through the central lumen that opens up into the, into the stomach. But the catheter itself is uh, a closed circuit. So any water that goes in to cool, uh, it does not get to the patient. It all goes in and out. Um, and you can use it for cardiac arrest situations. You can mm -hmm. use it for um, uh, intracranial hemorrhages and subarachnoid hemorrhages if you're trying to control their fevers. You can use it for infectious fever which, if you're trying to control that. Okay. You can use it for rewarming as well if you have an accidental hypothermia patient that you're trying to get back to normal. And you can also use it for um, the OR if you're in the operating room trying to keep a patient warm. You can put that cooling, well, I guess it's a temperature modulation device in yeah, okay. and keep the patient warm. But basically yeah. just for tight control. So. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And were there any just kind of big, so you were here today at the conference, uh, were there any big takeaways, because you got to sit through quite a few talks as well, mm -hmm. right? Was there anything today that was a big takeaway for you that maybe you'll think about taking back up to Canada? Well, I, I found interesting the debate about the 32 versus 36, or 34 versus, versus 36, because it's quite polarized. And I felt that if you're across the Atlantic in Europe, you're likely doing 36. If you're here in the U.S., there's a, there's a 50, well, I don't know, there's a chance that you will be doing 33, probably, um, and a small chance that you're doing 36. And I think, um, to be honest, what I think is, you need to cool early uh, if you so are to don't show. Delay. Don't delay. Okay. If you are to show any benefit, mm -hmm. because um, because really, even if you do cool to thirty three and you've cooled uh, four hours out, I think that's a bit late to actually get any neuroprotective benefit. Yeah. And so, 
these randomized control trials, they're great and everything, and I think they should keep doing them, but I think we should focus more on the timing, because uh, that's really something that um, uh, I think has not been really, you know, focused on in previous studies. And what do you, what it, what are your ideas about starting cooling in the field? So we've had, uh, actually in mm -hmm. Seattle, uh, we did the ice saline trial, which turned out to be a negative study. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some concern for re-arrest and pulmonary edema. But what is your idea about maybe some other method out in the field? So maybe something that EMS can start. Yeah, so um, intravenous cold saline didn't turn out to be the greatest thing. Uh, there was no difference in outcome, as you mentioned. Um, there was a higher rate of pulmonary edema on rival higher re-arrest rate. Um, so I think we should look at field cooling uh, through alternative methods. So yeah. I, would, I would be interested in work like um, the rhino chill device where they're cooling the brain mm. before the body and that can be uh, done by EMS in the field. The nice thing about it is you're cooling what needs to be cooled because really you're trying to protect the brain. Yeah. And so cooling the rest of the body comes secondary. That's not really your intent. Yeah. And so I like I like the rhino chill. I like how they're now doing a, there's a trial now called the Princess Trial, and I think we should get be, be getting results of that soon. So tell us about the Princess Trial. What is, do you know what that is? Or so it, it's basically randomizing patients to getting out of hospital immediate uh, cooling um, in the ambulance by okay. the rhino chill device, which is basically a perfluorocarbon device. Uh, it blows perfluorocarbons into the nostrils and it cools the brain first. So it's almost like a brain freeze. Pretty much. Okay, yeah. Pretty much. So that's one thing they could do. I think uh, putting ice packs on, um, there was a cooling helmet that was studied mm -hmm. and published uh, on uh, previously. And I'm not sure where that went, but I, I think that's quite promising. That actually looked very promising. I think it was published in 2000, because it was published yeah. before the Haka trial and the Bernard trial. Yes. And it was kind of one of the first published trials where we're like, kind of bringing this idea back mm -hmm. of targeted, you know, of, of cooling again. So. so I really don't know where that went, and I, I yeah. really think it should come back because that's where the cooling should start, and that's where the cooling needs to be, it's around the head. Yeah, okay. So uh, what are your long-term plans? So you've, you've been pretty busy, you're getting a master's in public health. Mm -hmm. well, what's your, what are your long-term goals? So I'm interested in post-cardiac arrest research, and my okay. long-term goals is to establish a database um, at least locally in our hospital, and then hopefully uh, implemented across the province of post-cardiac arrest patients. Uh, the hope is to have that as a platform for any ongoing research. Um, I'm also interested in uh, new health technologies. Okay. I'm currently collaborating on a similar device, uh, a nasal cooling device, uh, that actually utilizes plain oxygen tanks. Uh, using a sequence of compression and decompression of the oxygen um, through a vortex tube, it blows cold air into the nostrils, but you don't need a special perfluorocarbon tank for it. Okay. And that could be something that could be done also by paramedics in the field. Oh, yeah, because they all have oxygen, right? right. Yeah, right. that would be pretty easy. Um, so the hope is to grow in that area in terms of post-cardiac arrest research. How can we improve outcomes? Uh, we're still talking about 50%, um, 60% survival with good outcomes. So there's lots of research that can be done. Oh, absolutely. To improve that. Well, and don't you think, I think one of the things I got from the meeting is there is so much variability across the world in how we do things. And it's just, it's like we, we, we know we need to manage temperature. At least I'm pretty sure we know. Mm -hmm. Although this 33 versus 37.8, um, I don't know, I'm a little hesitant about that one. But, um, but it, now it's like the devil's in the details. Right. I just I think we've got to start fine tuning some of the practices and figuring out, you know, how we should manage shivering, how we should sedate patients or should we sedate, sedate patients? And, you know, it's like all the details. Agree. Agree. And I think like looking at paralytics, do paralytics make a difference? I think that's an area of research. Yeah. You I know, mean, they reduce myocardial oxygen. They reduce oxygen consumption in the body. And so they re reduce the load on the heart, likely in a cardiac arrest patient. Things like, uh, you know, cold sealing, that didn't pan out to be such a good idea, uh, in the field at least. And so really, I, I agree with you, the, the devil is in the details. How do you cool? How do you medicate? Um, and there's a lot of uh, neuroprotective agents out there as well that can be investigated. Yeah. And so, you know, how do we know that it's not the sedation that's doing the trick? Um, well, I guess we could if we randomize patients to getting sedation or not. But, yeah. But we know that a lot of these intravenous anesthetics do have a neuroprotective effect. 
So I, I totally except propofol. Except maybe propofol. <laughs> so, that was a big. Just I, I mentioned it in another video. That was kind of a big. There was one of the docs yeah. that had a big. Um, um, he doesn't like propofol. So yeah. 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 But we, I agree with you. I think uh, we should start dissecting out what we do and how it affects outcomes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So well, I want to thank you for being here, and your presentation was amazing today. Okay. Really enjoyed hearing it. But um, you know, and I just I love that there's so many young, innovative minds that are like yours pushing the science forward. You know, because I'm getting older, and I, I want this you. to be <laughs> I want this to be fleshed out by the time. No, I'm just joking. So, all right. Well, this is Nicole Kupchak, and this is Ten Minute Tidbits.